Good morning and welcome to worship with the South West Tyneside Methodist Circuit. This morning the theme set as we reflect upon one of the most talked about picnics of our time, where Jesus feeds 5,000 people. My name is April Lancaster and I will be leading worship this morning. Our Bible passage will be read by one of our members, Graham Herdman. Our reflection will be led by Reverend Martin James. On our prayers will be led for, by Trevor Capstick. And our music has been recorded by Centenary Methodist Church Crocrooks Worship Group. For our call to worship this morning, I've chosen a passage from Philippians, chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Often in life, we are faced with difficult times and seemingly impossible tasks. It's good to remind ourselves of this passage. As a church family, in these uncertain times and in certain future, it's also good to remind ourselves of these words. God is who we depend on, and he has been with us always down through the ages. Just as the words of our opening hymn tell us from verse 4, For why the Lord our God is good, his mercy is forever sure, his truth at all times firmly stood, and shall from age to age endure. Let's now sing our opening hymn of praise, all people that on earth do dwell. Thank you. 
to our prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Lord, you are the one on whom we depend. You are the one we follow. You give us all we need. You protect us through all the storms of life. You know all our needs before we do. You are always with us, even in the times when we don't feel your presence, Lord. Lord, you have given us your Son to be a living example of how we should live. Love each other, serve each other, and how we should share with each other. Lord, we are sorry for the times when we've doubted your ability to work through us and through others. We are sorry for the times when we've let you down and fail to offer what we have for your service. Lord, take us and renew us and make us disciples who willingly offer all we can for your work. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all you are doing in our world to change our selfish ways. We give thanks for food share, food banks and other charities who are striving to make a change in our world. We give thanks and praise for scientists, inventors and entrepreneurs who are working to find renewable energy sources and solutions to our plastic waste. We give you thanks for the vaccine that seemed an impossible task a year ago but is now being rolled out worldwide. You are a God with no limits, with endless power and capability. We ask that you will use us and guide us in furthering your kingdom here on earth to show your love to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Graham Herdman one of our church members will now bring us our lectionary reading for today. It's taken from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Then afterwards, the Reverend Martin James will bring us today's reflection. This morning's Gospel reading comes from John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias as it was also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass there. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over. Let us not waste the bit. So they gathered them all and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who has come to, to the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself. When the evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake, got in a boat 
and went back across the lake towards Capernaum. Night came on, and Jesus still had not come to them. By then a strong wind was blowing and stirring up the water. The disciples had rowed about three or four miles when they saw Jesus walking on the water, coming near the boat, but they were terrified. Don't be afraid, Jesus told them. It is I. Then they willingly took him into the boat and immediately the boat reached land at the place they were heading to. Amen. I suspect that most of us who are products of this scientific age feel a bit of guilty scepticism as we listen to the first part of that story, the story of the wonderful picnic, but I want to reflect on it. It was vitally important to the people of Jesus' day and the early Christians. It's one of very few stories that appear in all four Gospels, and Matthew and Mark have a version of it which appears twice, though with different numbers. There's no way we can ignore it or brush it under the carpet or say it didn't happen. I suspect that for most of us, and certainly those brought up in Sunday school, when we think of the story, it's this version in John's Gospel which comes to mind. We're reminded of the boy with the fish butties and of Andrew, patron saint of missionaries, one of the first to whom Jesus said, follow me, and always introducing people to Jesus, first his brother Peter, who will become the rock on which the church is founded, then this lad, and later on some of the first Gentiles to be fascinated by Jesus, a bunch of Greeks mentioned in John 12. Some of the disciples were a bit doubtful about them, but not Andrew. Andrew is a star, prime candidate for uh, best supporting actor, which is a bit hard on the other main character in this story, who often gets airbrushed out. When I used to test members of the Girls' Brigade on scripture knowledge, if I asked them to name the first disciples called by Jesus, I would expect to hear Peter, Andrew, James and John and say, well done. And I'd forget that according to St John's Gospel, the first person to whom Jesus said, follow me, was Philip. And actually Philip was the first missionary because he introduced Nathaniel to Jesus. And it was he who made first contact with those Greeks. But poor Philip always gets forgotten. I think that Philip was probably a bit of an awkward character. Didn't like waffle. When the disciples were all sitting back having a bit of an after-supper snooze in the upper room, while well, Jesus, to be honest, was going on a bit, it's Philip who says, oh, cut the cackle, what use of words, give us a vision, show us the Father. And I think, to be honest, Philip has every right to feel peeved at the way he's always the extra, he's never the star. And here, of course, it's Philip on whom Jesus picks. He says, what are we going to do about feeding this lot? Notice that, we. Jesus seems to be expecting Philip to come up with a solution to an impossible problem. There's no way their meagre rations can cater for this multitude. Jesus is asking the impossible. Mind you, Jesus does make unreasonable demands. Remember how he instructed the waiters at a wedding when there was a problem with a catering front to serve the guests with water from the wash basins? Sure, way of getting the sack, or worse. Oh, incredibly, they did it and got away with it. And this is just as bad. Then it's ordered to arrange food for thousands. He must be fed up. A bit like now, when Jesus' followers are faced with the new normal. Here we are. Normal church activities have been shut down for over a year. And before that, things were dicey. Numbers were falling. Finances were a problem. To be honest, fewer and fewer people had any interest in what the church stands for, and there were fewer of us. Most of us are getting older. And yet we read Jesus' last command, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. To be honest, like Philip, most of us feel that's a bit much. And then Jesus had a habit of, what, of asking what seems a bit much. And he also had a way of making the impossible possible. Enter the boy with the butties. Now, I don't want to upset anyone's susceptibilities, and I don't want to place any limits on what God can do. But this story takes me back to the bad old days, which some of you can remember. Most of us would like to forget. Imagine a group of friends have just finished dinner in our University Hall of Residence. 
we're feeling a bit of rela relaxation is permissible. So how about a game of bridge? We make the coffee, sit round the table, deal the cards. Then comes the craving. But I need a cigarette. For in those days, everybody smoked. A packet of Woodbines is in my pocket, but I know only a few remain. And I know that after this rubber, I'm faced with a long night wrestling with almost incomprehensible books. In the morning, I'm going to be expected to hand in an essay which will convince my tutor that the books have not only been read, but understood. A daunting task. Impossible without the solace of nicotine. How did I let myself become so dependent? Praise God that most of us manage eventually to keep the habit. The thing is, it would have been inconceivable in those days when everyone smoked to smoke a cigarette without offering the packet round. Few of them would refuse, so the choice was have one now while I want it and suffer later, or selfishly keep the pack the pop the packet in my pocket. Now it's interesting that John tells us that the feast of the Passover was imminent. So most of this crowd would go on their way to Jerusalem. The way led through Gentile territory where kosher food might not be available. So most of them would uh, carry supplies. Not many, but just enough for the journey. Now, we don't know what Jesus had been going on about before the picnic, before he put Philip on the spot. Probably the normal Jesus stuff about loving and sharing and caring and putting other people's needs first. Now, who then would dare to produce a picnic and eat it while hungry neighbours look on enviously. And then the little boy shows the way and offers his, offers his packed lunch to Jesus. And the rest are put to shame and their picnic campers are reluctantly opened. And even though a fair number haven't thought to come, come, to come, thought to come prepared, most of those who had prepared would have over-catered. So there's more than enough. And if you say that's to belittle Jesus and deny his miracles, I say, what on earth do you mean? What greater miracle could there be? Think, we sit in a world where millions of people are starving. Climate change means that many have no prospect of a real harvest. And here in this country, we worry about an epidemic of obesity. And good food is thrown out because it's past its so-called sell-by date. Sensible use of resources, different farming methods to provide sufficient for everyone. But it would take a miracle to change our selfish attitudes, make us eat less, perhaps pay a bit more. Only Christ could do such a miracle. Jesus says to us, as he said to Philip, where shall we get enough food to feed this crowd? And where's the boy with the butties who's ready to offer what he has and shame the world? Jesus often seems to demand the impossible. And there are many who dare to take up the challenge. You've read their stories in tomes from Christian bookshops. But let me tell you a story which you've never read. Beside me, you see a picture of an ordinary man. A man who lived a long life, but seemingly made little impact on history. Towards the end, he sometimes wondered if it had all been worthwhile. I've looked at this picture several times this week because it's 24 years uh, since I sat beside his bed as his life came slowly but peacefully to an end. He was an ordinary man, now almost forgotten. There's another picture, perhaps too small for you to see because it stems from a day when photography was less sophisticated and more expensive. But it's the same man in his early 20s, fresh out of college standing by the woman who for three years has been his constant companion, probably kept him sane. He's smiling, but that's just for the camera. He knows that he's not going to be seeing her for at least three years. The world is in turmoil. Everybody's future is uncertain. And yet he thinks he's heard a call. Now, any sane person would feel it was a call to an impossible task. He's about to sail to India. And he believes that he'll be able to introduce the people of that country, people of different cultures and religions, to Jesus. And he believes Jesus has called him to do that task. It means leaving everything he knows, leaving his parents, 
He can't realize now that before he sees them again, they will twice have to crawl from the rubble of houses destroyed by German bombers. But worse, he'll be leaving his fiancée, who is a stabilizing factor. In those days, mental illness and depression were very little understood. They were never spoken about. Though now one would know that it would take very little to drive this rather lonely and highly strong young man over the top. I've read his diaries. I doubt that in the present day he'd have been permitted to set off. I doubt that he'd even have been accepted into the ministry. But then he goes. He goes to a land where he knows nothing of the language. And after initial training, he's dispatched to the holy city of Banaras, where the river Ganges, sacred to the Hindus, flows, uh, flows uh, to a city of temples and religious fanatics. And then, because he's white, he has to live in a huge white bungalow. It requires a minimum of six servants to run it. And it's in a vast compound which contains a church, a hospital, a school, and all of them are part of his care. In a small modern brick house across the compound, there lives an Indian minister in far more primitive conditions. He's actually the titular superintendent of the circuit because the young man is only a probationary minister. But this is British India, and our young man must not let down his country. Before long, the chairman of the district's wife is going to tear him off a strip for the sin of sitting down to lunch in the temperature close to 100 degrees, but without his jacket. And what's his job? Well, the powers that be in London have suggested that some years previously, work had been done in this area among some of the poorest, most despised people of India. The untouchables were shunned by their own people, regarded as only fit for the most menial tasks like emptying the commodes. Even the rich, the richest have no white water. And they decide that this work ought to be revived. But how can they expect this inexperienced, public school and university trained, callow, shy, troubled, lonely young man from his position of privilege in a poverty-struck world to do a task like that. It's ludicrous. But he believes he's called. He tries. It'd be four years before he was eventually joined by his fiancée. Six before that, bungalow, that great bungalow became the place of some of my own earliest memories. My first memories of worship are in that church. My earliest friends were the children of the man who cleaned our toilets and the children of that other Indian minister. Well, my father survived, but only just at the points where he quite, could quite easily have taken his own life. More than 60 years later, soon after I moved to this area, I found myself once again in Benares, now called Varanasi. I had a very tight schedule. However, to my amazement and delight, I found myself in a hotel in the very area in which I'd once played. So I skipped the provided lunch and explored. I found our compound, now part of the campus of the local university. Our great bungalow is just a vine-covered ruin, but I found the church. A great deal had been done to it. It now has walls instead of rattan screens, which was the case in my day. The church was open, and to my delight, there were people there, cleaning, doing repairs, and one very smartly dressed young man seemed in charge, and I found he spoke English. Then I found that he was my old friend, whose father had once cleaned our toilets. The church at the time had recognized his promise and given him an education which would have been beyond the dreams of most of those among whom he grew up, and now he was repaying them for the debt. He told me that the daughter of the Indian superintendent lived just round the corner. But mostly we spoke of the work that the church was doing now, of the crowded Sunday worship where local people of all races and classes met, and of the outreach to students in the university, which was being led by some of those who were once part of the outcast community. And then in the church vestry, in a place of honour, I was shown a picture that nearly moved me to tears. That same young man, my father, who'd accepted the impossible call, who'd never had the opportunity to go back, was never made fully aware of what had been built on the foundations he'd laid. Most of those among whom he'd worked at that time were illiterate. 
So they never contacted him. But he hadn't been forgotten. And some people say that miracles don't happen. Well, we shall see. The new normal is upon us. The task is mountainous. And Jesus is saying to each of us, as he said to Philip, what are we going to do about it? And it only takes a boy with the butties, or a student fresh out of college with an impossible dream to say, well, as long as it's we, and you're with it, in it with me, let's do it for miracles to occur. Good morning, friends. And as we come to offer our prayers of intercession, you, you'll see behind me um, a picture of what is called Rublev's icon. Um, the image is over 500 years old, painted by a, a Russian iconographer called Rublev. And uh, it's supposed to evoke the Holy Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The figure nearest to me is intended to be the Father. Um, the figure behind the table in the centre is the Son. And the figure on the other side is the Holy Spirit. And it's uh, evoked by the story in Genesis 18 of the strangers, who, the visitors who come to Abraham. And uh, Abraham offers them hospitality. But in the Christian tradition, um, that strange story has become, um, if you like, a revelation of God to Abraham, but also to us. Uh, God in his fullness, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And as we've been thinking about uh, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, according to St. John in chapter 6 of his Gospel, uh, that story is a picture of um, God's generosity in Christ, God's abundance, God's nourishment for us all. And so maybe we could use the picture to see God extending this invitation, this welcome, uh, the offer of nourishment and feeding and abundance to us. And you'll see there is a space for each one of us at the front of the table in the presence of God. So we pray for that for ourselves, uh, not just today, but uh, in the weeks ahead. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as you met the needs of the 5,000, so we pray for those in need today, for those in need of food and water. We pray abundance. For those in need of healing, we pray courage. For those in need of peace, we pray reconciliation. For those in need of encouragement, we pray hope. For those in need of freedom, we pray release. For those in need of companionship, we pray friendship. For those in need of change, we pray opportunity. For those in need of forgiveness, we pray mercy. And for those in need of your love, we pray blessing. And so we remember all those in need and the ways in which God is working through individuals and agencies to meet the needs of other people. And we remember that God seeks to use us in his work to meet people's needs. And so thinking of John's story of the great feeding, we pray, Lord, help us to be more like Andrew and notice the gifts of others. Help me to be more like the boy, willing to share all we have. Help us to be more like the crowd, longing to hear your words, that we might be more like you. 
we ask our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I lead us in the Lord's Prayer. We can say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. We may not know the future, just as the disciples didn't know the future, when they willingly left everything behind to follow Jesus. But one thing is for certain, just as our closing hymn reminds us that the Lord will guard us, guide us, keep us and feed us. Our Heavenly Father will lead us on. So let's now sing, Lead us, Heavenly Father. to everyone who's joined us this morning for worship. Thank you to everyone who's taken part and a special thank you to all those who've helped others to record and upload their material to YouTube. And a final blessing. May the love of peace of God and his strength to face the impossible go with you out into your communities trusting in the knowledge that God will provide everything you need. Through the love of Jesus. Amen.